Uh, we're here at the Institute for Policy Studies, June 28, 2013. We're interviewing uh, David Eisner, who is the uh, owner today of the House of Musical Traditions, has been for many years, uh, runs uh, concerts uh, for the, uh, the, uh, uh, in the area, which we'll hear about in the Institute of Musical Traditions. And we're going to talk to him a little bit about uh, politics uh, in his uh, year, college years at the University of Maryland and about uh, uh, Maggie's Farm, alternative business and, uh, and the uh, House of Musical Traditions, among other things. So let's uh, get started and just uh, tell us a little about yourself, where you uh, grew up, how you happened to come to the uh, Washington area. Um, I grew up in the uh, wilds of northern New Jersey, basically in West Orange. Uh, my dad was a dentist and my mom was a physician. Uh, my dad liked New York City, so kept his practice in the city. Uh, so we were outside uh, when family moved when I was about two to uh, West Orange. And uh, I kind of, I ended up in the Maryland area probably, I, I guess you'd say I swam my way in. Uh, I was a competitive swimmer in high school and a couple of the guys that were older than me that were swimming for the University of Maryland, uh, we would, we worked at various summer camps. That was the ideal job if you were a competitive swimmer because you could come and use their pool and work out ahead of time and afterwards. So uh, they said, oh, your, your, your times are pretty good. Uh, coach probably could use you. So I talked to my guidance counselor when I was a junior and he said, now you'll never get in there. You need like an A minus average as an out of state student. You don't have that. If you did have an A minus, I wouldn't tell you to go to Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, fine. And then uh, I'd never been on a college interview, so I went down there anyway. Uh, and I thought I'd at least meet the coach and say hello. And uh, Coach Campbell said, uh, do you have a C average? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm easy. And he said, well, okay. Uh, let me see your application. So he took my application and he initialed a little box. And he said, yeah. Uh, That'll be fine. Just go down and, uh, you know, and just hand it into the registrar, and we'll take care of it. And I didn't really know what he meant, <laughs> so uh, he handed it to the registrar, and the <laughs> registrar said, "Well, I guess we'll see you in a couple months." And I said, "What do you mean?" She said, "Well, uh, Coach Campbell initialed your application." I said, "Well, what does that mean?" And she said, "Well, the university doesn't want to make it difficult for our student athletes from out of state to attend." So if the coach initials an application, uh, you get in-state requirements, which is why he had asked me about the C average. Mm -hmm. So that I, was what year it was? Uh, that was 1966. 1966. Okay. And uh, I skipped back up from the registrar's office to Coach Campbell's office to thank him. And I said, you know, Coach, I, I, this is really amazing because I told him about my guidance counselor telling me I couldn't get in. And I said, listen, I, I really, I'm going to dedicate a lot of my time to swimming. And I noticed right across from Cole Fieldhouse, there's a dorm there called Anne Arundel Hall. And, you know, I, if you could get me into that hall, it would be great. And he laughed and said, sorry, son, I can't get in there myself. It's a girl's dorm. <laughs> <laughs> so I, <laughs> I, I kind of uh, turned various color red. And I uh, said, well, yeah, okay, that's fine. Just uh, any place on campus will be fine. Uh, so uh, Maryland at the time, and this would segue into the political thing, uh, was one, one of the few universities that were lauded for the, the cool-headedness of the students in their support of the administration's pro-Vietnam policies. And I was in Time Magazine, some little quote, and I go, oh, God, <laughs> this is terrible. What am I getting into? I mean, Did you already have a political consciousness? Yeah, I mean, my parents were lefty yeah. Jews and, you know, coming out of New York. And right, right. most of my weekends in high school were spent in Greenwich Village. Okay. <laughs> so that was my street corner. Um, and so uh, I thought, well, that's, uh, I guess they're entitled to that opinion. And uh, the years, 66 through 70, uh, especially at Maryland, were, were very, very, um, I mean, they were the major transformation years. Um, Maryland went from being a very conservative school uh, until the uh, arrival of 
the uh, outside agitators, which were basically the out-of-state students coming down out of the New York and New Jersey area, and the Boston area. I mean, it's basically Maryland residents were kind of, they were running a little bit behind politically. Uh, so the, the amount of upheaval, I mean, the, oh gosh, I think the, yeah, the, on Mondays, women at the University of Maryland, if they lived on campus, had to be in their dorms at 10 o'clock for dorm meetings. 12 o'clock every other day, except Friday and Saturday, they could stay out to 1.30. Guys could stay out as late as they wanted. Uh, but I mean, it was a very conservative school. That was in 66. By 1970, we had co-ed dorms. So that's, that's about as 180 degrees as you could go. Did you get into Arundel Hall then? Uh, no, no, I was, a, I was all living off campus at that point. <laughs> but yeah, that, that would have been very unique. Um, but actually, I did attend a rally one time when one of the all-female dorms was uh, being transformed into, I guess we'd say, an integrated dorm of males and females because the plumbers had arrived with urinals and they were carrying them in, much to the cheering of the students. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it was, uh, turning more seriously though, um, it, it was a great time to be an activist. And there was a tremendous linking of other universities. Uh, and it was done basically through, you know, local phone services and, and long distance phone, there's no internet. Um, and oftentimes you could get uh, a person of, of national prominence uh, the poet uh, Denise Levertov, uh, Allen Ginsberg, uh, people like that would come and speak against the war and this would bring out a very good sized crowd uh, where you could essentially rally everyone uh, to oppose. Well, it was opposing the war, opposing racism, uh, trying to get workers rights. I mean it was all good stuff that we thought we were pretty sure we were going to change the world you know coming out of that campus. And you, uh, I believe, were associated with a, or helped create an organization that was... Yeah. From, yeah. Um, the most feared organization, uh, feared meaning that, that administrators on campus would fear, is this, if you had a Students for Democratic Society. Uh, there were certainly some SDS chapters that were very, very violent. I mean, some of them were more violent than others. Um, Maryland did not have an SDS chapter, so a bunch of us started an organization called the Democratic Radical Union of Maryland. That was called DRUM. And the, the beauty of that, and we were, we were infiltrated right away with what we called narcs. Uh, they weren't drug narcotic agents, they were uh, ob observers or intelligence for let's call it the other side. Posing as students. Yeah, yeah. posing as students. And you know, Maryland Maryland had a large military industrial complex because they had, they had campuses literally in Germany and, and you know, even in Vietnam. So there, there was a pretty strong military presence. Uh, ROTC uh, had a building on campus. Um, but you know, we, we knew that we were infiltrated and that didn't really matter because these guys would kind of vanish at an actual event and an event meant Oftentimes we'd start at McKeldin Library, which was the basically maybe eh, 600 yards from Route 1. Mm -hmm. Route 1 was the nerve center. Route 1 was the vein, uh, and it split the campus, basically. Um, so the concept was basically to rally at McKeldin Library. Uh, sound system sometimes was no more than a bullhorn. Other, other times a small sound system would be set up. If we had a sort of keynote speaker, uh, we'd, lots of flyers would be passed out about upcoming events. Uh, basically, it was a great way of communicating. And then once there was a good enough sized crowd, someone would start murmuring the chant, Route 1, Route 1. And that was, that was heaven, because you knew that if you could get 500 students or more down to Route 1, you were closing off a major artery of transportation. And the response on campus was to call in, sometimes, a, a SWAT team all the way from Baltimore. So if you think it was jammed up with a bunch of students on Route 1, when you bring in half tracks and Jeeps and a SWAT team on top of that, uh, which meant you got on the 11 o'clock news. And you 
somebody, they would quote somebody speaking at the rally or, you know, uh, yelling, and there would be tear gas and pepper spray and uh, uh, sometimes uh, shotguns filled with rock salt. You know, I mean, it was, it could get pretty ugly at times. There was never the National Guard there, or were they? Yeah, they National Guard would be there. I, I, was, I was a reporter. It was interesting because several of my friends had um, joined the National Guard in lieu of going into the military. So you literally were standing, there's a guy with a riot shield <laughs> whom you had, you know, Psych 101 with uh, <laughs> the following day. Right. And you're looking at them and they're looking at you going, well, how can this be, you know? Yes, yes. So they were getting their military deferment that way. Did, uh, did, did, were you ever arrested during any of these? Close, uh, yes, really yes. close. Yeah. Um, the closest <laughs> I got was, um, at, for a while they put a curfew uh, up, and they were targeting, smartly enough, uh, automobiles with out-of-state tags that also happen to have a University of Maryland sticker on it. You didn't have to be a real genius to figure out that would be one of your probably outside agitators. So I, my car was just that, <laughs> New Jersey tags and a, and a Terps uh, sticker in the back. Um, the curfew was 12 midnight, and a bunch of us, having completed our studies for the evening, so to speak, uh, went down to the Dunkin' Donuts on Route 1. And we were cutting it close. It was about 11.35, 11.40. We needed to get our donuts and get back before midnight. And when we came out of the Dunkin' Donuts, there were like four or five of us piled into my car, uh, we were met by a Prince George's County cop who said, what do you think you boys are doing? And we told him, uh, getting donuts. <laughs> and he kind of like was very curious. He says, well, I want to look in that car. I said, sure. And he said, uh, what's that? And he's got his big military flashlight and he's got his flashlight on uh, a Dayglow Frisbee that was behind my driver's seat. At which point I stupidly said, it's a Frisbee and kind of reached in and tossed it to him. At which point he pulled his gun. So <laughs> I realized that, that in retrospect that was a pretty stupid move because he A didn't know what a frisbee was and now one was flying at him and he's armed and I got donuts. Yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, Assaulting a police officer. It, with a frisbee, yeah. So <laughs> that was pretty close and the whole time we were watching what time it was right. because uh, we, needed, we knew that if he was stalling us to keep us out past 12 all of us would get arrested. So uh, we were close, but we got back. He let us go. Did your swimming career go by the boards? Or? It did. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> what happened is uh, it was very strange. In 1966, the Atlantic Coast Conference um, made freshmen eligible for varsity in every sport except football and basketball. Mm -hmm. So suddenly, Coach Campbell, who had a freshman team of 25 students, uh, 25 athletes and then a separate varsity team of another 25 or so uh, had to combine them into one. Mm -hmm. So he ended up cutting a lot of varsity and cutting some freshmen. Right. And in swimming it's pretty egalitarian. You have a time. If you can hit those times right. you're better than the next guy and if the other guy's better than you it's not like oh the coach liked you more or anything. So I, I remember this because it was very painful. Um, he kept 11 freshmen and I was ranked 12th just missed yes. but uh, you know the, I, you couldn't really uh, I continued to swim in her murals uh, there um, so it was okay I mean it took me a little bit to you know sort of adjust to that. Now, Paul of Maryland too you uh, uh, began uh, 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 arranging and promoting concerts too yeah. is that right tell us a little about that. Yeah. Part of it is getting cut from the swimming team uh, a guy that was on the swimming team that was a member of, of a fraternity said, hey, we've been the inter-fraternity council champs for the last four years. Why don't you come down to the house meet some of the guys? I said, okay. So I met a couple of the guys and lo and behold, it was a basically out-of-state guys, uh, New York, New Jersey. They were all there on weekends. Uh, there were 140 of us. So I joined the fraternity and then as I learned more about the fraternity, uh, one of the job positions open was the social chairman. 
And that's just a nice way in a fraternity of saying you get to organize all the parties. You get to hire the bands, whatever drinks you're going to serve, uh, find the hall if you're going to use a firehouse, if you're going to use you know, uh, a social hall in some other facility. So I, I said, yeah, I, I can do this. And so I became a social chairman, uh, which then also the fraternity was very active in student government. So there, uh, meaning that we were interested in being school presidents, school vice president, treasurer, uh, and they ran spring weekends and homecomings. So as my fraternity brothers would take those positions, they'd say, hey, you want to work on spring weekend? I go, sure. Cole Fieldhouse? <laughs> yeah, I'll book a show in Cole Fieldhouse. So I kind of learned that way uh, and started booking larger events. Uh, to me, the, the most fun I had was booking, it was an up-and-coming band, I think, out of the San Francisco area called Sly and the Family Stone. Now, that was, as psychedelic music was coming on, um, they were right up there. You know, they, that was, they were at the top of the heap, that, that particular sound. Plus, they were an African-American group playing kind of psychedelic. And they were danceable. The other group, the support act, was a group out of Philadelphia, I think they were out of Philadelphia, called the Dells. And they had a major hit called Stay. And that definitely was a more, um, more Motown-y, R&B, soul kind of sound. So by putting the two groups together, we were appealing to a much wider range. And that, I mean, essentially, it was diversity. Uh, and I thought that would be a great show. How could it get better? When I met Sly and the Family Stone for, in the armory at Maryland for the sound check, there's a basketball in the corner. We got to play basketball <laughs> with Sly and the Family Stone. How could it get any better than that? When Sly said, you want to get high? I'm like, oh, oh yeah. And he says, let's go on the bus. And they had a tour bus. I'm going, well, wait a minute, what about the driver? And he leaned forward and he went, uh, driver's my dad. <laughs> so uh, I was introduced to the, uh, the world that way uh, as well. It was, uh, it was a pretty, pretty interesting event and you know, the concert went off really well. It was sold out, things like that. Um, the student government basically had advisors in the administration for these weekends because it involved a fair amount of money. I mean, you were doing Cole Fieldhouse I think it's 14,000 people. I mean, it's gone now, it's Comcast Center, but... Um, so, this was, this was instructive in a lot of ways. I, I actually uncovered some fraud, <laughs> which got one of the administrators uh, fired, because he was scamming it. Uh, he basically hired a band through an agency that didn't exist, and it existed in, on paper in his world, so that he could get a a separate cut from the band by hiring them at a higher fee. They would be willing to play, say, for 2500 and he hired them right away for 3500 And I called this to his boss's attention, and the boss said, thank you very much, and I noticed a few months later the guy was gone. So, it, you know, I, I question a lot of things if it, if it doesn't sound right or look right. I mean, did, um, you, did you ever get in any difficulty with the uh, University administration, be either because of uh, kind of politics. A little bit. Yeah. I mean, these this most of it, most of the really um, powerful stuff was my junior and senior year, sixty nine and seventy, mm -hmm. uh, where sometimes the university would be closed. Mm -hmm. um, the Skinner Building, which was the philosophy building, uh, they staged a protest, and there were eighty seven students arrested, mm -hmm. uh, and that they became known as the Skinner 87, you know, they, uh, um, buddies of mine, uh, I said, that's a bad idea, but they said, no, it's a good idea. They burned the ROTC building. And one of the guys got caught. I, I was like, Larry, get out of here. And he's like, no, 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 no. You know, and he, he hung out too long, got caught, went to jail for five years. So, I mean, it, so, I mean, to me, the art form <laughs> was to, my personal philosophy was not hurt anybody and make a statement and get out of there and don't get arrested. I mean, getting tear gassed was not fun either. Um, 
you know, especially the canisters were like shot oftentimes into the bushes like near the McKeldin Library. They landed there. So days later, <laughs> some student would be walking by and the canister wouldn't have fully discharged and it would leak a little bit and the air would blow. <laughs> It'd be like a Wednesday afternoon and be three students that were just tear gassed right. by no one in particular. Right. So it, it, it was... It was a very interesting time at the University of Maryland. So you uh, graduated then in... In 70, yeah. yeah. I, I started a graduate program in American Studies and dropped out in 71. I, I started getting more interested in businesses. Yeah, so, so uh, the, your first business then was Maggie's Farm, was that... Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And where, where was that physically located? Number one, Columbia Avenue in Tacoma Park. Okay, okay. Um, I, uh, with a another guy I'm still close with today. Um, this, this is a good digression here. He was a fraternity brother. The fraternity of 140 guys, when Nixon did the ping pong ball thing when you, to find out what your draft status was, we set up our own uh, fishbowl and put it above the TV. And if you attended, everybody put a dollar in. And then we sat in front of that TV and they called off the birth date and they assigned a number. Mm -hmm. I mean, on one level, it changed people's lives, whatever happened at that particular. Mm -hmm. And uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn was ready to go to graduate school, but couldn't go to graduate school until he found out what his number was. Right. Right. So his name came up, or his number came up, out of you know one being, I would say, the worst number you could get, because uh, that meant you were going. <laughs> you were going to get drafted in the next two weeks um, if you were under 35 basically as far as a number. He came up at 327 so now he could go to graduate school right. and we cheered you know. So who got to, who won? <laughs> the winner was the guy with the lowest number, the guy that got you know out of the 140 guys sitting there, I won. I was number nine <laughs> and uh, they handed me my hundred and forty dollars, and uh, then, because there was a good, strong fraternity with great brotherhood, they all proceeded to go upstairs in their rooms and turn on the Beatles recording of Number Nine, <laughs> Number Nine, <laughs> which uh, it was, it was a hell of a day. What, what, what did what I happened, do? What happened? Yeah. yeah. Um, Luckily, and it, you know who knows who's going to see this thing. And hey, I'm I'm way out of the statute, statute of limitations. We're yeah, gone. Right, yeah. There were uh, certainly plenty of um, you know anti-draft centers. There was one at GW, and uh, asthma would get you out. Mm -hmm. My mother, being a physician, we we had every single record because these were her friends. That you know my pediatrician, and you know I'd get hurt you know, break an arm or something, she'd call her butter Jerry, and he'd say, hey, he broke his arm, meet me in the emergency room, we'll set it, you know, stuff like that. So, uh, uh, I developed asthma, and actually it was pretty legal in the sense that I already had hay fever, and the pediatrician noted in my record that I had um, hay fever with near asthmatic-like symptoms. And I, I had pretty bad hay fever. I mean, if I wasn't in air conditioning in July and August, I couldn't function. I mean, it was a mess. So uh, I was immediately, of course, 1A, pending, uh, pending the hearing of the medical board. And uh, I was able to eventually get a 1Y, which meant only in times of national emergency. So that kept me... That was, but I mean, my first move was to uh, apply to uh, Gil, McGill University in Canada. I was leaving, yes. and my parents were like, "That's fine. You know, we 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 have the means to visit you in Canada." Mm -hmm. So it it, it, was, it was a pretty astonishing time to watch people's lives shaped by the bouncing of a ping pong ball. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So, given that uh, reprieve, you then. Yeah, I was able to stay in the area. <laughs> so, um, Glenn, I mentioned Glenn because we had actually started a candle making business. I remember, folks, this is the 60s. <laughs> so we had, uh, we had rented a uh, basement room in a private house and uh, we were making some candles under the business name X-Wax. 
and <laughs> it uh, where we're selling to some boutiques, and boutiques had a very short lifespan. Uh, in the case of Maggie's Farm, it had existed for about seven or eight months. The couple that started it basically broke up as a couple. Neither of them wanted to be there. So that was one of the places I'd been wholesaling my candles to. So I bought their inventory. Uh, oddly enough, I bought it. Uh, my partner was a pharmacist, a DC pharmacist. So the <laughs> Now you have a situation where a DC pharmacist is half owner of a business that sells pipes and papers. So <laughs> he said, no drug deals. And I said, Eddie, no problem. No drug deals. I'm not interested in, you know, I'll sell them the pipes, I'll sell them the paper, but we're not dealing weed out of the back. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically that's, so Maggie's Farm flourished at that point. Did, uh, did you get visits from narcs uh, or even official police visits? Uh? Not only did we get official visits from police, um, if you look out of the second floor window of number one Columbia Avenue, which incidentally is now the great business still point, uh, a, a healing spa, hmm. so acupuncture, therapeutic massage, uh, you know, so it's, in a way it's sort of carried on a tradition of alternatives. Uh, if you looked out the window of Maggie's farm, you could see the police station. <laughs> they happen to be slightly down Columbia. And uh, one day, uh, we're sitting around on the second floor, you know, burning some incense, unpacking new clothing that had come in in unisex fashions. Uh, this cop comes in and he goes, uh, uh, I need a holster made. <laughs> and I said, well, we have a leather shop that was part of Maggie's Farm called the Hind Quarter. And uh, I said, well, yeah, we, I, I suspect we could do that. And he says, well, I want, it, uh, I want a symbol on the side of it. And I'm thinking, oh, God, here we go. But he wanted a peace sign. Really? Yeah. And he said, you know, guns sometimes are known as the peacemaker. <laughs> and I said, well, yes. <laughs> so this was a great, you know, great moment. So then, of course, a couple of his buddies saw it, and they wanted it. So yeah, we had a very good relation with the police. Um, and we were very careful. Uh, we didn't do anything stupid. Uh, and we, you know, we sold water beds. We sold, um, you remember the Yes bookstore that was down sure. in Georgetown? Yeah. We, had a, we had a lot of alternative books, you know, books on meditation and books on uh, vegetarian cooking. I mean, it, you know, it was good. Oh, Can I? Oh, absolutely. I wanted to ask something also right sure. here. Sure. Uh, I was around all those, those years uh, in the 60s and 70s, and, and what I remember is besides all the political change, so much of the memory of, of everything was set to a backdrop of music, and the yes. culture became a real driver of things. It was clothes, it was drugs, it was music. Yeah, and it was food. all it, it was, was all this, intertwined. It was all intertwined. Yep. So, it, so it was very much a part of the culture of the '60s here, as as, as elsewhere. But um, I'm wondering when you um, bought Maggie's Farm, and then later the House of Musical Traditions, um, you started that. Did you have um, anything in mind other than, um, well, I mean, contributing to the general culture that, that right. grew up, the subculture that grew up here? Or did you have a different business model or uh, anything that other yeah, places? Did you have a mission with the with Yeah, your? several things happened. Um, first, uh, my dad was a dentist by day, uh -huh. but was a uh, member of the New Jersey Symphony and played in quartets. So I was always around music and musicians. Um, so I, I was comfortable in that environment. Yeah. I, I started playing violin as a kid, but most of the kids I was growing up with in New Jersey had last names like Melnick, Mariano, Johnson, Franklin. You know, these were not like standard Jewish kids that all want to, you know, we're going to play violin together. We, we were much more interested in football and <laughs> basketball and swimming. And so, and my dad said, okay, you know, learn how to switch hit, be Mickey Mantle, you know. Um, but anyway, the, the music thing was always simmering with me. At Maggie's Farm, two of my finest employees were Liz Meyer of Liz Meyer and Friends. She's recently deceased. And JB, her boyfriend, JB Morrison, was a mandolin player in the group. So underneath Maggie's Farm was a coffee house called Sagita. And Liz and JB oftentimes would conclude their day retailing upstairs and go downstairs, grab dinner, and perform at Sagita. Most, 
importantly, they eventually started playing regularly at the Child Harold. Yeah. And they would split the week with another up-and-coming singer-songwriter named uh, Emmy Lou Harris, which most people remember. So they actually shared a house for a while. Um, so the music scene was really starting to take off. I became pretty bored with, with the sort of emerging drug culture. Uh, watching a 14-year-old come in all blitzed out, buying rolling papers, it just it, it wasn't what I had in mind. That wasn't really the way that I wanted to kind of support myself. On the other hand, the music business, you, you couldn't find oddball instruments under one roof. You wanted a sitar, you had to go to an Indian restaurant and hope the guy spoke enough English to see if he could get you one from Calcutta. You know, if you wanted a doombeck, you went to a Mideastern restaurant and hoped that one of the dancers maybe had a friend that had a, a doombeck. Um, African instruments were almost impossible to get. So it, it occurred to me that, well, wouldn't it be cool if we could put them under one roof? And so we, we took a shot at that. Um, so there was a brief period where Maggie's Farm and the House of Musical Traditions existed at the same time. That was a pretty stupid time of my life. I had like no time to do anything but trying to run two businesses that were a block away from each other. Uh, looking back on that, that was definitely um, crazy because um, there was very little overlap between the businesses uh, except for me. <laughs> so uh, eventually I sold Maggie's Farm and went full time with House of Musical Traditions. And it was located uh, in a different place? Yeah, it was now. at 7040 Carroll Avenue which is just further down Carroll Avenue in Tacoma Park. Um, some people, and I would say somewhat erroneously, think that the reason Tacoma Park is the way it is is because of House of Musical Traditions. And I said, no, 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 no. No, the, I picked Tacoma Park because it was a, it was a nice community. They were mostly vegetarians, um, mostly Adventists, who really didn't interfere with anything anybody else did. You know, they didn't rule with an you know, iron hand or anything. They just, it was their community and happened to be rent-wise or even to purchase one of the last places that, that kind of was economically feasible. The cluster of artistic people, I mean, it's possible that maybe some guy that was buying guitar strings from me and lived in Tacoma Park said to his friend, a bass player, hey, why don't you move into Tacoma Park? It'll be easier to rehearse and there's a music store down the street. I mean, but I, I think it's just really, lots of people noticed that this was an arts community without being formally designated as one. So. I think I read that there was, uh, did you acquire some inventory or something from uh, New York? Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the original House of Musical Traditions was uh, run by a couple in New York that made lap dulcimers, Appalachian dulcimers, that they sold to the great Appalachian dulcimer player, Jean Ritchie. And as she would tour college campuses and coffee houses and concerts, people would come up to her and say, where can I get one? And she'd say, oh, call Hank. Here's the guy's address. He makes, he makes the ones that we're playing. Because there was nobody left in Kentucky in the Ritchie clan making lap dulcimers. But there was a guy that had an apartment above the St. Mark's Theater in the East Village that was building lap dulcimers. Uh, so, uh, but Hank and Lynn started to import instruments. And really, they didn't want to do that. It was taking them, it was taking time away from the building of the instruments. More importantly, they were moving to California to follow this I guess you'd say religious group that they had gotten involved with. And they kept handing me these like fat paperbacks going, yeah, it's this guy, L. Ron Hubbard, you know, his, his writings are really great, you know, and I'm like, I don't know, man, I, I, I'm, I'm reading comic books now, you know, leave me alone. <laughs> so uh, you know, they, they were Scientologists, and apparently part of becoming a good Scientologist is you, you get clear by giving away almost all your possessions and moving to L.A. You know, um, so I didn't know that actually until a couple years later what was really going on. So they kept, for a while, they kept the dulcimer business, but their small amount of inventory that you referred to, which literally was $1,500 in 1972, I bought the name and that and greatly expanded that. Because as I was sort of running around with this idea of, well, why don't we, why don't we see if we can get, you know, musical instruments from around the world under one roof. 
somebody told me about this guy up in New York. So I was already familiar with the area, short trip up. So that's. We'll get on to your uh, concerts here locally, but you mentioned your father was a classical musician. You yep. took violin lessons. Did you, did you ever play any other instrument? Or did you ever not, not formally. I can demonstrate a lot of instruments, yeah. like an African thumb piano, an Irish boron, mm -hmm. uh, a couple chords on a mandolin. I knew early on that if I were to concentrate on an instrument and get into a band and start staying out till two in the morning, the store would suffer. Yeah. So I surround myself with musicians. <laughs> and I've also gotten into sound reinforcement, which does the same thing as being in a band, except you stay out even later. But yes. I love it, and I've got great people that I'm working with that you know, can cover for me if I'm away at a gig. So. Yeah, and with the classical, then you had Sly and the Family's Stone, yeah. and various, then moved on to uh, really traditional uh, musicians yeah. from all different cultures and nations and uh, we, we did started you, did you always have this really eclectic uh, I think so yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think part of it was growing up around the village mm -hmm. uh, you know I mean it was 90 cents to take a bus literally from in front of my house in West Orange on the DeCamp bus line and took me right into Port Authority and then went over to took the subway over to West Forth and mm -hmm. you know there you were um, so we, that was really our street corner uh, a lot of guys in high school, some of the girls, we, we didn't really go on dates as much as we went as friends, and we just kind of hang out. We always had to sit in the no alcohol section, which were bad seats, but at least we were inside. <laughs> and the, the waiters would hold up signs, no alcohol, to make sure the other waiters wouldn't bring us beers by mistake. So we were interested in hearing John Coltrane, Archie Shepp, Ornette Coleman, Pharaoh Sanders, you know, the jazz was just spectacular. And as a high school kid, I thought, and remember that at that time, they were guys like Pharaoh Sanders um, and Ornette Coleman, they were incorporating what was then called the East West fusion sounds. So you were getting Eastern sounds brought into Western jazz. That was a new idea then. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so they, a lot of it was just sort of all coming together in that. From, uh, of course, the uh, House of Music traditions has survived. You remember other alternative businesses from yeah. that time? I mean, just oh, yeah. to name a few, and yeah, was any of them more successful for a long period of time, or did it all sort of crumble uh, in the mid-70s or so? Uh, yeah, it's just... Um, well, the food co-ops. Yeah, the food co-ops co is good. Yeah, the Tacoma yeah. Park Silver Spring Food Co-op. Right. In that very same location, number one Columbia Avenue, for a while was the Tacoma Cafe. Right. And uh, I had a small hand in that because when they were looking around to open a cafe, you know, a good, what would be a good site? I told uh, Mark Elrich, I said, hey, 1 Columbia Avenue. He says, it's a house. I said, uh-huh, but there's commercial uh, plumbing in there because there used to be a restaurant called Sagita. There's an oven and more importantly, there's the venting hood already, you know, in there. So that saved thousands of dollars of, you know, Montgomery County is pretty voracious on its, you know, when you're trying to get through the health department. Mm -hmm. So it had a lot of the stuff it needed. So they opened the Tacoma Cafe there, which when they were closed on Mondays, I would, I had my concert series there for a couple of years. So it was very, there were some funny moments in there too. <laughs> when did you start your concert series? In 1981. So it was later, yeah. 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 The concept there was to give something back to the community. I mean, I'm being supported by these wonderful musicians you know, that I said, well, let's have you in concert, you know. Someone worked in here. Oh, yeah. Too, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was. I have a question about that, too. Um, there were these alternative businesses, lots of, lots of them around in the, in the 60s yeah. and 70s, too. Um, did you ever find that there were certain businesses that you wanted, alternative businesses that you felt allied with in some way or that you yeah. wanted to, did you have any sort of group, a formal group? No formal group, but. Um, Certainly in Tacoma Park, the, we have one business to this day that's a chain. That's the only one. And that's the subway. And even that is hardly noticed because they don't have their normal subway advertising and bright awnings and stuff. It's much more subdued. Um, so by coming, uh, certainly bookstores, cafes, it, it was all 
there's, there's still really no nightlife in Tacoma Park. It wasn't until 1984 that you could order uh, an alcoholic beverage in Tacoma Park. That's right. That was the Tacoma Cafe. We all sat at the table and <laughs> hoisted up the first legal drink because the Adventists don't drink. Since they don't drink, they had a law. It was a very interesting law. They said you cannot operate uh, or disperse alcoholic beverages within 500 feet of a church activity. This was actually on the books in the city of Tacoma Park. You figure, well, you, that's simple. You just move 501 feet away and open it up. Ah, they're slicker than that. They would make sure that they owned a building within 500 <laughs> feet and they would open up a social counseling service there, a thrift store, some Adventist activity that would block you from doing it. And of course, once you knew that as a history, obviously people stopped trying. And certainly some of the worst bars I've ever been in were the ones that were sort of, you know, dotting the perimeter of Tacoma Park. <laughs> I mean, these places had no reason to be open except for the fact that they was... Slip across the line. You slip across the line and, yeah, they were terrible. You know, dirty, overpriced, you know, just, yeah, just terrible. But, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's what made Tacoma Park so amazingly different. So you weren't formally organized together no. to do that, but you were friendly with the other options. Yeah, I mean, business. to this day we have, like, you know, the business association. It's called, uh, it's not called the Chamber of Commerce. It's called the Old Tacoma Business Association. We chose that name because that way, if you're in D.C., you can join so that it's D.C. and Maryland because there is a Tacoma, D.C. Right. It's not a lot of businesses there, but we didn't want to make them feel isolated or, you know, well, you're not in Maryland, you can't join. So, you know, if you look at the businesses in Tacoma Park that are members of it, and then you look at, let's say, a, I guess for lack of a better term, a straighter business organization, uh, you can tell right away that Tacoma Park is, is pretty different. Uh, uh, we just were the first city in the nation to give uh, voting rights to 16-year-olds. First in the nation. But it's nuclear free. It's been nuclear free for a while. And, um, but, and you don't chickens have to, chickens don't have, have to be, be cage free. Right? You don't have to be a citizen, is that, isn't that right? That there was a, yeah, I think it's a, a there's a resident, yeah. Resident decided, yeah. Yeah, not so, a yeah, I mean, so it's, it's a pretty progressive town. Um, Sammy Abbott was the mayor. Yeah, when we right. talked. Yeah. When did, when did the Tacoma the folk festival Start, yeah. started, I think, in 77 or 78. And I think you and have a story about Sammy Abbott. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, we, you know, every festival, uh, you want to have people that are going to draw a crowd. I mean, it's nice to support local music. We we'll always do that. But occasionally, if you have a headliner, well, that, that helps. Yeah. And Sammy, uh, as mayor, even before as mayor, had a pretty strong friendship with Pete Seeger. So he got one year, he said, Pete's going to play. <laughs> and we're like, you're kidding. He said, nope. So we put him on at 3 o'clock on the field stage. We're even careful in that festival not to call a stage the main stage. Field stage is the biggest stage. But don't call it the main stage because that, that's kind of a slight to people that aren't playing on the main stage. So our stages have names like the Grove stage, you know, the Seventh Heaven stage, the, you know, whatever, but not the main stage. So anyway, so Pete was on the field stage, and as we were drawing up the program, uh, and the band, we were looking at the times for other bands to play, you know, on other stages. It was the only time I can remember that no band wanted to play at 3 o'clock when Pete was on the field stage because they figured nobody <laughs> was going to come. So we celebrated that instead of instead of like suffering with it, we said, yeah, that's, let's do that. Let's, you know, let's have three o'clock be dark on every stage except for when Pete was there. So the, the Hill probably had 2,500 or 3,000 people to hear Pete. So Sammy was, I think he was the one also that coined the phrase that Tacoma Park was the largest stand of hardwoods east of the Mississippi. <laughs> so <laughs> Sammy was pretty amazing. Uh, and again, pushed through, as mayor, lots of stuff that had, because it had been primarily Adventist for years and years before then, 
you know, a lot of things that should have been on the books weren't on the books. Sammy got them through. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so many people forget about that Adventist influence. Yeah. They refer to it as the People's Republic of Tacoma. Oh, yeah. Park well, they, see, that, yeah. the interesting thing is yeah. the, the Adventists literally saw not only the handwriting on the wall, but the handwriting in the subway. Mm -hmm. When the Metro was approved for Tacoma, D.C., the Adventists didn't want it. See? But they couldn't stop it because it's in D.C. Mm -hmm. And they said, we're out of here. Because they knew they were going to lose the control of the town. their town. So they moved up to Clarksville. So most of the Adventists have pulled out. Uh, you know, I mean, there's still the college there. There's right. still the high school there. Right. But uh, the idea of, of ruling the whole city uh, the way they did, it's just, they knew that. Because now you would have homeowners, uh, you know, with two working adults that were not Adventist and obviously would... Uh, be a stronger political force, and you know, I think they they were absolutely correct, and they they exited gracefully. It wasn't, you know, but yeah, once they saw that the metro went in, and that's why the CVS is in Tacoma Park. That's actually in D.C. It's you know, it's just on that side. I mean, there's plenty of other stuff that's independent in the D.C. part. Big Bad Wolf. The uh, clothing store, uh, Supergirl, the woman that makes these incredible soups, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that's all on the D.C. side. So it's, you know, what's happening, uh, we, we're going to get a busboys and poets. Yes. Um, yes. What's happening is the land is, it's close enough to the metro, and there isn't that much, quote, undeveloped land around any metro stop, except in the Tacoma Park area. So the real estate guys are coming in going, Pfft. This is a no-brainer, and they're right. I mean, it's it's gentrifying even more. Yeah. I don't feel bad about it. I mean, it's 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 evolving basically. I mean, if you're going to put in things like, you know, Supergirl and uh, Big Bad Wolf, and you know, you're putting in interesting things that fit in with Tacoma Park. You know, they're not coming in with a Walmart. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Um, did you have any other? Anne, did you have any other questions? I was just going to ask. Uh, besides the. We were sort of limiting it to the 60 to 75 yeah. period, but if you've, uh, you've done huge yeah, we, concerts, small concerts yeah. uh, in, in the years uh, uh, since then. And, yeah, um, what happened in 81 is we, we started running the concerts in the store, and we outgrew the store. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, I mean, w were we naive? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we would say to people, look, if you want to sit down, there's hardly any room. So see these instruments, these guitars, we'll put them in cases, put them in your car, and then after the concert, bring them back. <laughs> so that made more room. And mm -hmm. people said, you're crazy, stuff's going to get stolen. I, maybe, but it, it, I don't think it got stolen. I don't ever remember, you know, because you know, the folk music community is, is different. You know, it's, yeah. somebody would feel terrible if they stole a, a banjo out of a house of musical tradition. So. Of all the people you've had there, are there any particular favorites you have? I mean, that if, you yes. were, if you weren't running it, you'd say, I'd pay to see those well, people. Well, Dave Van Ronk. Yeah. Um.